You're watching the VSO Gun Channel. Thank you for tuning in. It's excellent to have you here as always. Now, really quick reminder, check your subscription statuses. Make sure that everything is the way that you left it. Many of you have confirmed over the course of the last several weeks that you've been either outright unsubscribed or had your stuff messed around with. Just because you are seeing this video doesn't mean that stuff hasn't been switched around without your knowledge. Make sure that it is set up the way that you want it to be. And today, we're going to be talking about body armor terminology, and I've been trying to get this video done in the form of a short but I can only get it down to a minute and a half, and that is absolutely rushing through the topic. And I just think that if I can abolish that timeline, then we can get a better quality video for you guys to reference. The other thing about that is I could throw a sponsor on if it's a full video, right? I'm sorry. I am a slave. Specifically, I wanted to talk about not only the individual threat levels, but the terms NIJ certified or NIJ rated? What do those things mean? Because there's a common misconception, and this actually came up in my most recent video about the Safe Life Defense Hyperline, uh, which is the thinnest body armor that I've ever tested. I, I have a full video out on that that you can find. I'll have it linked in all the appropriate places if you guys want to go run that thing down. Uh, they do offer VSO subscribers a discount, by the way, because that is a relatively expensive piece of body armor. Uh, but that said, as I mentioned, I have to pay the bills really quick. So before we get there, let's hear a word from our sponsor. Kentucky Anna Gunworks is best known for their research and development into lubrication technology. Their enhanced reliability oil is the product that I choose to use to keep my stuff running year round. And they've also recently released their minimalist quick release sling retainers. KGW offers VSO subscribers a discount and you can find that information over at the affiliates page. Special thanks to them for making today's video possible. Now, there's a whole bunch of different threat levels out there, right? And we'll get to those individual threat levels and what they mean, what they encompass here in just a moment, as well as my opinions on whether or not products in that particular category are worth a darn. Uh, but before we do, I wanted to focus in with this video on the difference between NIJ certification and rating at an NIJ threat level. There's a difference between those two terms, and I think that oftentimes the interweb will ascribe a significant difference between the two terms. What I'm saying to you is that personally speaking, uh, I think that oftentimes those claims can be somewhat inflated, but there is a difference between the two and you should be aware of what that difference is. So we're going to start with NIJ certification. What that means is the manufacturer has made a particular product and they've sent it to the National Institute of Justice. They've sent a whole bunch of samples to them and they've conducted a series of tests to determine whether or not that meets their certification criteria. If it passes the certification test, then it gets their seal of approval on it. So you'll see it stamped NIJ certified and it will be in NIJ's database. Rating at an NIJ level, it does not necessarily mean that it would not pass NIJ certification, and all armor that is NIJ certified is NIJ threat level whatever rated. It just may not have been submitted to the individual NIJ to, for certification, right? So they've either tested it themselves at the various threat levels, or they have uh, sent it to a third party, and they have tested it at those various threat levels, you can claim that it meets the requirements of NIJ threat level whatever and say that it's rated for that, but it is not certified. You see what I mean? Now, the difference between those is somewhat semantic, and you can get into an argument on that. But generally speaking, what you as a uh, responsible citizen should understand is that this is simply one additional step. And there are reasons that you may or may not, as a manufacturer, seek NIJ certification. For instance, if it is not NIJ certified, then more than most likely your agency that you might be trying to sell it to, if you're a manufacturer, uh, is likely not going to be able to acquire the funding to be able to uh, procure that. Now, if your market is predominantly the commercial market, then you don't really care about an NIJ certification. It's a little feather in your cap if you meet that certification and you go through the process. One of the reasons that you might not do that is that it is expensive and it takes a long time. So just because something 
doesn't have a current NIJ stamp on it doesn't mean that it hasn't been submitted. For instance, the most recent video that we did on the Safe Life Hyperline, uh, I have received word that it has passed its NIJ certification, but you won't see that certification report for probably a month or so because the wheels of government always turn slow. You guys understand that implicitly at this point in time. Those are the facts. Now, as far as my opinions on NIJ certification, should a business only sell NIJ certified products? Absolutely not. That would be a horrific business decision. Why on earth, if you have a product that you know meets the requirements, why would you sit on it for months on end while you wait for some government employees to check some boxes? It makes absolutely no sense. That'd be a terrible business decision. Personally speaking, as a classically educated scientist, I appreciate having a uniform standard to test things against. I think that that's vital. We must have this. However, <laughs> when something is rubber stamped by the government, my autonomic response is skepticism. I assume that the people working in government are incompetent. I'm not saying that the people who came up with the standards 20 years ago or whatever it was uh, for those tests and wrote the standard operating procedures are incompetent. They probably were. However, given the things that we've seen perpetrated by our government over the course of the last couple of years and decades, I automatically assume, unless proven otherwise, that that government employee is incompetent based on the fact that we do not live in a meritocracy. We, the government operates through a seniority-based system. You just simply have to log your time and sit around long enough, and you can become head honcho, regardless of your competencies. Ask anybody who has worked in government for any length of time, and they will confirm this. Time for the ratings. I'm just going to pick a couple that you're likely to find on the market, and then after I go through the individual ratings, we'll talk about uh, whether you should consider a viable product or not. First is level two. Level two body armor is going to be good for nine millimeter and 357. There's almost always an asterisk there that denotes short barrels. So if you're talking about putting something like this up against like a 357 lever action Henry, it is not rated for that. So think snubbing 357s and nine millimeter pistols, those types of threats, pistol threats. Uh, level three A is a step above that. And that is where you're going to consider things like, uh, I'm happy to see 357 SIG on the list now, but predominantly, this is where you step up to 44 Magnum. That's where the, the limit kind of tops out. You can also consider uh, level 3A to be 5.7 rated, so keep that in mind. Although some level 2 body armor can stop 5.7, you should consider the minimum uh, protection level for 5.7 to be level 3A armor. Your level 3 is the next one up, and that is going to be your rifle rated armor. And that is good for uh, 5.56, and the top out on that one is 7.62 by 51. So 308 ball ammunition is where you should kind of consider the top level of level 3. Now, there is a, a designation that I don't believe is official, and that is level 3 plus. And that's where you get to your green tip as well as your 30 odd six. So level three plus is kind of between the, uh, the level four armor and the level three armor. It's just slightly enhanced. And then your level four armor is your 30 odd six armor piercing rated. So you're talking about the big stuff. Now, there are things to consider in there that I'm not going to dig into here, but you should look at the individual requirements for like back face deformation, number of hits, and you know all that sort of stuff. Now, should you consider various products in each category? Level two, I would say don't waste your money. There are some agencies out there that, for whatever reason, they still use level two body armor, probably because it's the lowest bidder type thing, right? Um, again, back to government incompetence. Uh, but I would not want any of my friends that serve in a law enforcement capacity to be running around with level two armor on, right? They should have at least level three a armor. And as we did just a few days ago, um, it, there are products out there that meet that standard are just as comfortable as level two armor. Now, when you get to your rifle rated stuff, personally speaking, do I think that you should consider the difference between level three and level four. I think that 
It should depend on your environment. Personally speaking, I run around with level three plus plates because the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene plates are super lightweight. They're neutrally buoyant and they protect me up to 30 odd six jacket at hollow point or soft point or whatever. Am I likely to come up against those kind of threats? The vast majority of, of firearms in the United States are under that standard. Now, if I was somebody who is rolling around in a place that they shot a whole lot of 762 by 54 r at me, yeah, I'm definitely packing those level four plates. But I, I think that a lot of times the increase in weight as it relates to the level four plate to the level three plus plate, um, I don't see a whole lot of validity in most applications for the level four plate over the level three plate, particularly if you work around water, right? If you're, if you're working in a maritime environment, um, those level four plates are going to take you right to the bottom. <laughs> Whereas level three plus plates um, that are made out of that neutrally buoyant material, you got at least a chance. You don't have to com- You don't absolutely have to cut away your vest if you find yourself in the drink. Anyway, that is my perspective on body armor. I hope that you learned something in the, today's video. If you did, then please sound off in the comment section down below. Interact with the video in some way. It definitely helps tell the machine that more people need to see this video. And hopefully we'll see you in another one here at the VSO Gun Channel.